everyone. My name is Dan Richardson, and I chair of the Vermont Center for Democracy at U Board. I'm with you tonight. It is Tuesday, February 19th. The other members to my right are Rob Sidwin, Kevin O'Connell, Meredith Crandall, staff, Kate McCarthy, Brian Payne. Yes, uh, first item of business is an approval of the agenda. Make a uh, motion to approve the agenda. I second that. Okay, there we go. And I have a second that by Rob. All those in favor of the agenda as printed, please signify by saying aye. On the agenda. If there are no comments, we'll then proceed straight to business briefings. The next item of business is the approval of the February 4th uh, minutes. And the interested eligible are uh, myself. Second. Second by Kevin. All those in favor of the minutes as printed, please raise your right hand. Whether eligible to vote, and it's minutes. All right. And with that, we can actually get to the substance of the day. Um, the first item of business is 27 Fourth Street. So if you'd like to come up and <coughs> make copies that are specified, and what I'll do is I'll have your your name for the record and I'll put you up at both. Is there anyone else here this evening that will testify on 27 4th Street? Okay, so just state your name for the record. Okay, okay, thank you. If you raise your right hand. Will you solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the payment penalty of perjury? Good. So, uh, Meredith, why don't you give us an overview of this application, and then I'm going to let the applicant uh, give their presentation. Okay. So I'm going to keep this pretty brief. Um, so this is a renovation plan. Um, the big reason that it's here before the board is because part of the plan is um, partial, uh, well, demolition of a portion of a contributing historic structure. Um, so that bumps it up here immediately. Um, it did also go through design review um, because it's in the design review district. Um, and you'll need to re-review that and look at the recommendations from the design review committee and confirm that those are all going to be included as conditions on any permit going forward. Um, there are some minor site plan questions that came up during the review um, that uh, most of them, I think, deal with facts that the applicant will need to address, such as coverage amounts um, and an issue with regard to exactly how far the corner of the porch and the rear of the building will be from the um, one of the side projects. Um, but the big issue is really the demolition. And uh, just to be clear, the um, application is for demolition of a contributing yes. structure. Not the structure itself, the main structure. Correct. It, it's it's an addition and um, a shed that are attached to the back of the building that right. were added on after the original building. And this, for members who have been part of this board for a while, this is a revisit um, with a changed plan for the renovation, you know, plan. But that demolition of the rear portion was part of the old plan as well. So it's right. I was going to note that that the I think it was Kevin and I were here before. I don't mm -hmm. know if. Okay, I don't think so. Okay. And uh, so it is a few <coughs> years. It's been mm -hmm. a few years. Let's see how time goes by. Um, but uh, obviously we're not bound by that earlier review, but I did remember that we hadn't reviewed that, and I, I remember that there were some questions about <coughs> the historic um, contributing nature of this, this portion of the building. And I presume that based on the application, Testimony to offer as to the contributing nature of this portion that you wish to demolish. With that, I'll give you the floor. Thank you. 
first place, knowing that it would need a DLC, but it just is, has lived in the home since 2014, um, until very recently, in order to accommodate the renovations. Um, the demolition uh, will be of the shed and uh, a new addition um, that are not original to the house. Uh, we do not know a date for it yet, uh, but we suspect it's new completely. Is there a reason why you, you date it that, not that late, but that different of a time if this is a sort of 19th century structure? I will let Dan speak to the lead on that. I don't okay. have as professional an opinion on that one. Yeah, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know exactly when this was built. We can tell it wasn't original. We can tell, we can see there's some kind of ghost lines in the paint um, on that rear gable end, but clearly there was perhaps another little shed back there at some point. The quality of the construction was, was uh, markedly different than the quality of the construction on the original house. Uh, the original house was a well-built uh, house. Um, the rear addition and shed is a very poorly built um, you know, uh, addition and shed. Um, and maybe, maybe some of it has a, and some of it is not finished space. The shed is certainly not finished space. The addition maybe it was never finished space and maybe someone in the 40s kind of attempted to, or at some point along the way attempted to kind of bring it into the house to increase the square footage of the house. Um, the finishes in that space kind of scream, you know, 1940s. No offense to that, of course. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt, I just was curious. Um, so the intention is to renovate the house. There will still be three residential units, uh, one unit on each floor first floor uh, going from a three bedroom to a two bedroom uh, unit and the second third floors uh, will be one bedroom units. That's the scope of the project. And so wh what's lost by the demolition is that it goes from a three bedroom on the first floor to a two bedroom. Is there any impact on the second or third floor? It is uh, an impact on the second floor. Currently, the second floor addition, which would be demolished, uh, houses the kitchen. Okay. So you're going to, it's going to accompany a, a sort of renovation within the apartment itself, then moving the kitchen forward? Yes. Yes. Um, over the last four years, as I've lived in, in the house and used the house, um, sometimes I've, I've lived on each floor. So I've experienced the problems on each floor and the opportunities. Um, and I've rented out each floor, of course. Um, the second floor has been a two bedroom with that kitchen being in the addition section. Um, and so this would uh, move that kitchen to where one of the bedrooms is currently. Dan? When you say the addition section, are you referring to the addition on the back? Because I note that there's also a little bit of a bump out on one of the sides. Correct. Okay. Yes, I'm referring to the addition in the back. Uh, we, um, we had for some time assumed that the bump out, which is about five feet, mm -hmm just on the first floor. Um, although the second floor addition is matches mm -hmm. um, that bump out that was on the first floor. Okay. Um, we suspected for some time that that bump out was not original to the house. Mm -hmm. More recently, um, Dan's opinion is that it may well be uh, that bump out on the first floor original to the house. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of things to look at that I hadn't considered in the past that indicate it may be original. Looking at the, at the drawings of the, the elevations, I just want to make sure I fully understand. Um, and I'm looking at A3, and that's <coughs> that seems to illustrate. So you've got the, the existing front porch of the house that's staying the same. Uh, and I'm looking at, at the existing east elevation on, on that drawing. Um, and then you've got the, the, the main house building, I would say, and that's going to stay the same, uh, except for looks like you're replacing a, a window, a door with a window. Um, and then it's in the back, really, that the demolition's occurring. And so is that entire section, in your opinion, Dan, um, 
newer to the house? Uh, okay. So it's a, it's a distinctively different quality Absolutely. than the main house? From foundation to roof. Okay. So it's not as if you're taking a part of the old house and deconstructing it? No. Okay. The original house will be, you know, will undergo would undergo the remodel, but that rear half is absolutely a different vintage. Okay. Well, let's dive into some of the other issues. So when that portion is taken out, um, you're then going to resize the back of the house mm -hmm. and add that covered porch. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, anything else as far as kind of what changes Exterior. on there? Uh, so, you know, wi window, si windows, siding, okay. and the porch. Yep, that is all. going to jump to the uh, provisions for the teardown because I think that before we talk about any of the setbacks or issues I think we do have to take a look at the I just want to make sure we do the right findings mm -hmm. that we have to, and because that seems like a threshold, because we don't get into any of the coverage issues unless we can make a sort of determination as to whether or not the um, the standards have been met for the the demolition. So, to the extent we have questions about that, I'd like to go through the findings that we do need to make. Mm -hmm. um, and so. Under th section 3004, um, section D2 states that the demolition or replacement of any structure or portion thereof listed as a contributing structure to the Vermont Historic Sites and Structure Surveys and the National Register for Historic Resources is prohibited unless the Development Review Board approves the demolition and site restoration plan and the Board makes the following findings. A, rehabilitation of the structure or portion thereof would cause undue financial hardship to the owner. So if you could address that criteria, uh, it hasn't necessarily, I mean, I understand that it's of a lesser quality mm -hmm. than the main house, yep. that it looks like it was added on, mm -hmm. but I mean, that's true of a lot of old houses. What, sure. what makes this cost prohibitive to um, renovate as it exists yeah. currently today? I would, um, in, in no particular order, um, the foundation, it's, it's not on a, it's not on a quality foundation. The rest of the house has a has a real foundation under it. This back part of the house has, you know, some rocks laid on the ground, and it's like you know, a little a little crawl space kind of scramble to to get in there. So, um, I would say to um, for starters, it, it needs a new foundation. Um, the lot is very, very hemmed in. Um, there is a, a significant ledge on the um, north side of the property that comes down right to the building, um, you know, such that you can see over the years that north, that north uh, wall system has been, you know, repaired and repaired again, and, you know, you, know, you can see it's just kind of undergone some pretty, pretty marginal marginal quality repairs over the years um, as you know kind of debris and and leaves and things just kind of have found their way into that kind of acute angle there um, 
So would you call that a perpetual problem that it's just always going to have either it, rock slides or leaves? It's impossible or to <coughs> detail that properly in its current state, for sure. Um, so you one cannot access the foundation repair from any side other than the driveway side. Um, and yet one would need to get access all the way around to do a, a proper foundation repair. What kind of foundation does it have? It's got, it's, it's like some rocks just kind of, <laughs> you know, placed there. The original um, slab. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's pretty, pretty minimal in its yeah. present, in its current state. Um, which I'm, you know, Theo can, Theo's, you know, kind of shared some stories about various, various, you know, critters getting in there and wreaking havoc within, within the house. Um, I believe at least one picture was submitted uh, that shows um, a, a shot within the shed, um, the foundation of which is just dirt. On the story issue, I think you did a great job with the uh, baiting skunks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish it weren't true. <laughs> it was better, better than fiction. It was a, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not far enough removed from that experience to not think of it fondly. <laughs> Uh -huh. I'll try to contain myself. <laughs> <laughs> so to, to put to put a you know a real foundation repair in there would require lifting the building you know significantly up in the air to, so that we could excavate properly and you know we have you know that that's that's an expensive that's an expensive proposition right out of the gates um, and then you know the amount of structural repairs that needs to that would need to happen to the existing kind of structural components you know is is it 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 really just kind of a significant portion of it just needs to be rebuilt. Um, I'm certain that the the sill all the way around the things that's sitting on those rocks is just completely shot, and that rear northerly wall um, is also just completely shot. Um, so again, so we start with the foundation, significant expense. Structural repair is significant expense. It needs, you know, it needs the siding is, you know, in incredibly poor condition, so new siding, new windows. I mean, the whole thing just really needs to be rebuilt. And then, of course, the interior finishes would need to be gutted. There's no insulation in, in anything over there. Um, it's, just a, it's just a complete rebuild um, to the point where, in my experience, it, 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 would, it would be an unreasonable amount of money to, to capture an otherwise fairly small amount of square footage that would not be not cannot contribute much to the way of, uh, of uh, marketability or, or you know, income you know, revenue for that for that uh, for that property I'm noticing in the staff report that these repairs have been estimated somewhere in the neighborhood between 165 and 185 thousand mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. that was a that was a study that that I did um, just kind of adding up all the things and then probably some more that you know that, that I just kind of rattled off there yeah. known problems and the known unknowns mm. right yeah. um, and then uh, there was a supplementing letter that the deterioration of this particular area was not caused by by your neglect, but just was inherent within the, the nature of this this portion of the building. Is that? I, I don't know that I specifically stated that in my letter. Um, I did include a letter from Board yeah. Joyce, who I purchased the house from, um, and he had uh, been upfront with me that this portion of the house would have to be demolished um, at some point. That's a conversation I had had with him at the point mm -hmm. of sale, um, and uh, and I had asked him why, and he said. It's in really poor condition. It's not original to the house. Um, it's not a good use of space. And he walked me through it, and we looked at it, the various issues, um, most of those being foundational. Um, so I was, I was aware that there were significant issues with it. Um, and I cleaned up the, the, the garage, or not the garage, but the shed. Um, it's a two-story shed. Right. And, uh, and used it uh, s sparsely for some storage over the last number of years. Um, and fell out of favor of doing so because it was, it felt dangerous to go up the stairs um, within the shed. Um, and a number of times I put my foot through a hole in the, in the shed and hit the dirt below. So I determined that it, the 
is not good for the purpose of which it currently is, is standing. Uh, that's the shed. The addition uh, is uh, is been used uh, as living space. It's the kitchen on the first floor and a bedroom on the first floor. And on the second floor is just a kitchen, sort of a, uh, a dining area next mm -hmm. to it. Um, and as Dan was describing, the finishes on it uh, were quite poor. So when I had a blower door test done, and had a, an energy audit of the home, uh, those areas read as particularly leaky. Um, although there were many leaky spots throughout the rest of the house too, to be sure. But um, my hope was that area was newer and perhaps had some insulation, and that's not the case. Um, but just so I understand, I mean, I, mm -hmm. I can understand the under the the the, the shed portion seems to answer to all the issues. But then the addition to the house is that the have the same issues, Dan, with the lack of a foundation. Okay, so it's of a of a piece, even though it's a little bit more habitable. Yeah, the found the the, found, the condition of the foundation that I described was specifically for the. Addition. Okay. I actually haven't. I, I haven't crawled far enough back in there to know if what's going on is for underneath the shed part. Mm -hmm. um, so the foundation uh, conditions that I was describing were specifically for the addition. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any questions? No. Sort of further. <coughs> you know, I'll simply note that there's two two standards. One is about undue financial hardship to the owner, and the other is the demolition is part of a site development plan and design plan that, if applicable, would provide clear and substantial benefit to the community. I, I presume you're going the first route, which is the undue financial burden, as opposed to presenting some uh, community development plan. Or I, I, I believe our project clearly qualifies for both. Okay. The, 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 the benefit to the community being this uh, this blighted section of building being removed and creating parking spaces that don't currently exist uh, on a very, very tight corridor in the city. Um, I have a neighbor that is very uh, optimistic and hopeful about there being more than one and a half parking spaces on my property uh, that my three units would avail themselves of as that's been a challenge for him and his tenants to navigate as we share that space. I, well, I have no doubt that that's a benefit to you. I, I just think that at least the second part, is when it talks about clear and substantial benefit to the community, raises a slightly higher standard than, you know, I mean, I think that's true of any downtown property if you tore down the back side of, you know, French Block, you'd have more parking spaces um, and fewer units that you needed to occupy with such parking spaces. Um, and it, is, it is an or. Right, right. I, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I think I, I'm just trying to understand to make sure that, that we're doing the right analysis with the undue. Because I think, you know, I want, I'm just one board member, but I mean, I think the undue financial hardship is, is something you've presented a great deal of evidence on and more than sufficient. But I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing anything or that there, was some, there wasn't some other plan. Um, anybody else have any other questions? I think I was sort of going the other way just because the actual full the list of things to be considered for undue financial hardship under the current regs okay. versus the 2011 regs is so extensive. Um, uh, we do have. Well, yeah. and actually. But I mean, there's, there's, as long as it, there's not an and in there. Right. And so this is one of those things where I was, it might require a little board interpretation because I don't think we've dug into the financial hardship quite so much um, so far in demolition under these regs and the yeah because we're talking yeah. about an income producing right the standard the for the, the income st producing is that the building site or object cannot be feasibly used or rented at a reasonable rate of return in its present condition or if rehabilitated and denial of the application would deprive the owner of all reasonable use of the property. Yeah, Which and that's, that seems a much higher standard to me, and that's why I was going more in my analysis in here of sort of the, uh, not just focusing on the benefits to the applicant, um, but the benefits 
to neighbors also. I mean, you're almost talking a public health issue if you're talking about pests and yeah, right. I think so. Vermin and the safety of that rear structure. I don't know. Um, you know, this is just my staff yeah. thought process. But that's why I didn't so go into the full financial analysis in here because it seemed that we did not necessarily, couldn't necessarily get enough data. Well, what is the current value of the property on the grand list? Two hundred nineteen thousand five hundred dollars, which was the sale price of the maintained. It's Pardon? It's maintained its value on the ground. <laughs> I'm kidding. It, I mean, um, apparently, uh, I, I mean that mm. that in and of itself is. And you bought it how many years ago? Four years, uh, five years in April. So Dan, the hundred and sixty five to hundred and eighty five thousand dollar estimate is to remove it. No. No, to that was rehabilitate it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, That's the, the new foundation, the structural repairs, the siding, the you know, the roofing, the whole the whole thing. Maintain just the addition or the addition and the shed? The latter. Do you have any sense of how removal of that or how rehabilitation of the structure would affect the value of the property? I mean, you're not adding any actual square footage above now. You're essentially just making what exists safe. Yeah, I, I don't know that I'm qualified to, to answer that. The owner of the property, do you have any sense of whether you think that it would greatly increase the value of the property to rehabilitate as from, opposed to from a demolish? From standpoint or from a marketability standpoint, uh, maybe two different questions. From a grandless standpoint, I'm not sure it does. Um, it, uh, I could say in the eyes of a lender, um, as it doesn't add square footage, um, the argument that it adds value is, is limited to rehabilitate that space. Um, but from a market st marketability standpoint, Certainly those units are more attractive if they're fresh and that space can be used without the current issues that you face in using those spaces, particularly the vermin. It's, it's a problem that I've never been able to, to stop or you know, lessen in any way. I grew up in New York City, and I, I joke with my family and friends back there that they don't, don't know what mice problems are like until they've lived in my house on Court Street. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that does. And so, I mean, one thing is if you increase the number of off-street parking spaces, it would theoretically increase the value. Theoretically, it's all, I mean, smaller square footage for the units. Right, but I mean it. But, but the off-street parking lure maybe make it more marketable, especially in a town that has had so many, you know, winter parking bans this year. I, 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 I would say that I've definitely encountered tenants, prospective tenants, for whom that was a top-level concern, as it, it is for me. I mean, I'm looking at the, at the standards for determination, and one thing that the statute doesn't, bylaws don't say, is that, that the applicant has to hit each and every single standard squarely. Um, and I'll just note that, you know, the first, the first one talks about the applicant's knowledge of the property's historical significance at the time of acquisition or of its status subsequent to acquisition. Um, and I think, I think the applicants met that um, burden by showing that subsequent to its acquisition, or you know, at the time of acquisition, he knew this was a portion that needed to be torn down, uh, or that was in rough condition, as opposed to the other portions of the house, um, and that this was always um, had different historical significance. The second talks about the structural soundness of the building. And I think we've heard a lot about that um, and their suitability for rehabilitation. And both of those do not 
um, seem like a workable solution here. C talks about the economic feasibility of rehabilitation or reuse of the existing property in the case of proposed demolition. As Ryan pointed out, you know, we're talking about a, a demolition that's close to equal the entire value of the property. Um, with with a end result uh, of if the renovation is done, the value of the property would not double because we're just talking about a small portion in the back. Um, and then it talks about the current level of economic return on the property is considered in relation to the following. The amount paid for the property the day purchase, a substantial decrease in the fair market value of the property as a result of the de denial of the permit, fair market value of the property at the time the application is filed, real estate tax of previous three years, annual gross and net income from the property, remaining balance on any mortgages or finance secured by the property, and all appraisals obtained within the previous three years, and any state or federal income tax returns. I think these are all things that possibly could be considered or used by an applicant to raise a financial viability issue where the other factors aren't there. I don't necessarily see a reason to go deeply into those. I mean, what it seems, if I'm understanding the testimony correctly, uh, it's that your property hasn't decreased in value. And if this permit is, this demolition is denied, it's not that the, it's not that you'll be denied the right I didn't deny it will not be decreasing in value, but it will just simply hold at this sort of consistent level. It's of a particular type of quality, and what you're proposing is essentially to rehabilitate and renovate, and there's some evidence that that would increase the value. With off-street parking, better fixtures, I mean, you have you would have a modern kitchen, at least in two of the apartments, um, and so, then subsection E talks about the marketability of the property for sale or lease considered in relation to any listing of the property for sale or lease. Again, this is not something that you've attempted to do to market or sell or lease the property. Um, F talks about the feasibility of alternative uses that can earn a reasonable economic return. It's not, the key here isn't that the economic return is such um, you're affording the apartment, you're continuing to be able to live in it. It's just you've now built up a certain amount of money to invest in the property. And presumably, once these renovations are done, it's a tighter, more efficient house. And those payments pay off over time. And then your rate of return increases, right? Perhaps related to this is we might conclude that if you spent the money to rehabilitate the additions on the back, you would not be able to charge rents that would allow you to pay that, pay back whatever you borrowed. You, you would not be able to achieve a reasonable rate of return right. to cover the costs of the rehabilitation of the rear. <laughs> and and this rear section is not a it's not an um, acute problem. It's not as if it's falling down right now today, but what your testimony is also that it's on its way. It's it's a perpetual problem. It's not getting any better. For a while. Yeah. It's been on its way for a while. It's been on its way for a while. Certainly, at the time I purchased the house, it was clear that it was on its way. It's a slow walk. Towards. Um, we don't want to let it get there, especially not in that location in the city. So again, uh, studies and evaluations I don't think are relevant here input from community organizations, preservation groups, other associations, or any private citizen who may wish to evaluate and com comment on a submission made under a financial hardship provision. Again, we is there anyone here who's here to testify about this renovation project? Um, I, I will say that my time spent serving on the DRC with, uh, with Eric Gilbertson taught me that if someone was definitely going to flag concerns about the demolition of any stru historic structure in this town. It's my friend Eric, and I was curious how he would review this project uh, a second time, um, and I was, I was pleased that he focused on aspects of, uh, of the exterior of the renovation of the original house, um, and was quite 
quick to dismiss any potential concerns about demolishing the shed in addition. That's just because you never met Margot George. Uh, <laughs> I don't, don't know them all. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's, God rest her soul. Um, but uh, it, she makes Eric look like a pushover. Um, That's an accomplishment. Yes. <laughs> um, so when we talk about the determination of undue financial hardship, which, I mean, I, and I'm pushing the board to go in this direction. I'm not hearing a lot of pushback. Is I, I just think that the community benefit, I mean, obviously any property that's cleaned up has some community benefit, but I think that's just, it talks about clear and substantial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it talks about community as opposed to neighborhood or property, um, which suggests something larger than the property itself. And so I think we, we fall under this undue financial hardship. And so, um, you know, the determination of undue financial hardship may be granted only if the project fully complies with one of the following requirements. So, so this is income producing property. The building site or object cannot be feasibly used or rented at a reasonable rate of return in its present condition or if rehabilitated or if rehabilitated and denial of the application uh, would deprive the owner of all reasonable use of the property. Um, the way I would read this particular provision is that um, the building or, or site you know, cannot be used, feasibly used or rented at a reasonable rate of return its present condition um, or if rehabilitated, which is Kate's point that you would never even come close to capturing the amount of money that's necessary to rehabilitate, to, to rehabilitate the existing structure on the back. Um, and you really are faced with a situation where do you either tear it down, I mean, do you either let it continue to rot and maybe let that rot transmit to the main part of the house um, or make the business unfeasible because of frost issues, foundation issues, um, structural issues that you, your expert is testifying to. Um, and I think that in that respect, the denial of the application would basically deprive you ultimately um, of the reasonable use of the property uh, because you're faced then with the situation of either letting this rot into the earth um, or to um, pour ungodly amounts of money into a fairly minor portion of the property. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's not forget the uh, the health effects of the uh, right. no no action uh, option. Right, and I think that's where the pest and vermin really do impact the quality of life inside the residence of the house. So while yes, it's better not to have pest and vermin are going to. I mean, you know, look, they're they're going to scurry back up the cliff and and hide out. Um, they're they'll not going to go away. They'll just wait another decade or two exactly. and come back down. <laughs> exactly, but they're not going to. Um, but I think it will have a, a huge impact on the quality of yeah. life. I say that having renovated uh, my house and listening to the mice who have gotten up into the... We, we've all been there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. mm -hmm. um, I agree with the chair's approach um, to talk about this in terms of the um, financial hardship test rather than the clear and substantial benefit to community test. Um, I think that's important for us to do in terms of setting up how we think about future demolition applications. I do note that in our new zoning regulations, and this is the first time I've used them for demolition review, um, we have a much higher standard for financial hardship than we did before. Um, I think on balance, we have met that standard. Um, and I hope that we can continue talking about those standards and whether they're gonna help us achieve our goals. So in the old ordinance, that they did, didn't even mention financial undue hardship, is my recollection. Mentioned economic feasibility, I think. Yeah. And there was there a it was squishy. Er. It, yeah. I don't have it here, so I can't. Sort of have it here, I'm, 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 but I do know that this is much much clearer. Um, the all reasonable use of the property standard is extremely high. I think on balance we can probably make a determination in that area, but um, I would maybe, so let's keep an eye on that in the future too. Yeah, agreed. 
I appreciate the chair's approach on that as well, to because the the factors for consideration under three, if really all you're talking about is this high standard of deprivation of all reasonable use of the property, then why did the regulations have, you know, eight considerations that we're right. supposed to do if it's really as simple as do you have any reasonable use of the property or not? I mean, right. so I think you have to read those into 4A and look at it in this more holistic approach that we're adopting here. I also think it, it's not clear in here, but I think we do have to consider, consider the value of what's being demolished. Um, because in, I, I think in, if this were the main part of the building, it could certainly be the case where it's, you know, the cost of rehabilitation is exceptionally high mm -hmm. and may not be easily recaptured through rents. And yet I still think in situations uh, that economic hardship alone should not be sufficient to demolish a historic building. Here, and this is why I personally think that it would meet either test. Here you're talking about removing a later addition that was poorly built. You could make the argument that that would actually enhance the actual historic part of the structure, which would be a substantial community benefit. Um, in addition to the parking, in addition to removing an unsafe situation uh, that was not created by this applicant. So I, I don't know. I'm comfortable doing either, but I do think that uh, that the approach we're taking here could be read to, I, I'm not sure I'd be comfortable with the economic hardship analysis if we were talking about the historic portion of the building, like the front right. section of the building. Yeah. Yeah. If you could just say, there's no way I could recapture this through current rent rates, right. the cost of rehabilitation, um, you know, that's right. a different analysis. I, I think there's two things embedded in that uh, observation, which I would agree with, and one of which is, you know, there's, there is a balancing, you know, the, the difference between a uh, shed that was kind of tacked on and expanded uh, sometime in the early 20th century or mid 20th century. Um, versus the original historic structure um, itself, as well as I think there's an, and it's not called out explicitly, but I would argue that there is at least an implicit um, understanding about good faith and bad faith in maintaining the property. And I've been around long enough to have seen this regula these regulations come into play in Montpelier, which didn't exist. Um, and in part, they were done for the purpose that there were a number of historic buildings where the owner would just simply wait until the property rotted into the ground and rehabilitation was no longer feasible. Um, and I don't, I, I don't have the sense that this is from the testimony that this is the case here. Um, all right. So I think we've, unless Rob, you want to chime in, which you don't have to. I'm not asking. <laughs> um, so let's let's move back then. Um, so when we talk about the rear setback, um, which I think is the next question. So my, my sense here is at least a weather report is that we all seem to be in uh, agreement about the rear, the, uh, the demolition, that it, it meets these standards that have been set out. Uh, but when we talk about the rear porch now goes into about five feet into the setback area. Um, and the Meredith, we're we're talking about this is this is essentially a, a waiver, right, for the setback. Yeah. Um, um, so you there's the problem is that the, uh, the, what the waiver allowance is for the porch. Sorry. Um, I think is, sorry, I don't have that right in front of me at the second. I think the max waiver is five feet. Yeah, the new, well, that's what, that's how much is supposed to be. The new rear porch is closer than. Right, right, that's what I'm saying. The allowed is five feet. Okay. From the distance. Are, when we're talking about the porch, are we referring to the item labeled deck on drawing A1.0? Yeah. So it's for a plan. Yep, so it's labeled deck Kay. on the on the the elevations mm -hmm. um and the floor plan. It's just that um in our regulations 
my understanding is that a deck cannot be covered once it's covered it's a porch okay all right i guess i have one question um the fact that it's inside the footprint of the existing building how does that um it's unclear there isn't that so uh, yes it's inside the existing footprint however it is a new structure okay. being added okay. you know what i mean so so you've it's not like it's not like the porch is technically a nonconformity gotcha. right because the nonconformity you can allow something that's currently there to remain there but once you remove that completely on your own and it hasn't fallen down by itself, you can't rebuild it. But if you were proposing to rebuild, to, to tear down, put a new foundation in, and rebuild the same addition just such that it wasn't falling down, that would be a permitted Well, rebuilding. you wouldn't, right, you wouldn't be rebuilding it from scratch. You would be, right, you wouldn't rebuild, you'd be rehabilitating. You wouldn't completely tear down the addition piece by piece and take all the sticks apart. You were talking about lifting it up to put the foundation in. It's not exactly catch twenty two because I wouldn't do either one. But, um, <laughs> if you were yes, typically, scenario, yes. if you were going to put a foundation under something, you don't take it all apart and then put it all back together. Cool. That's that's the scenario we were talking about. Yes. Has the applicant fire, filed a written request for a waiver for this dimensional requirement? Um, they haven't filed a written request for the waiver because the analysis that they would actually need a waiver was on my part was a little too late for that. Um, so no, it would be a, it'd be oral. I tried to put as much in here as I could. That works okay. too. Thank you. So, so we understand. Um, and is this on the east side that the, where the five feet mm -hmm. non-conforming? Uh, western. 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 Western elevation. Yeah, so it's the western elevation. Okay. So if you look at the site. Yeah. The site plan. Yeah, if you look at the site plan, that's really the best view. So that's on A1.0, the proposed okay. site plan. But it's 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 just the portion of the, the porch that sits behind that little bump out that's already right. existing. Mm -hmm. Right. So so you they're not they're not extending the line of the house right. closer to the setback. It's flush. In, in that respect, then, okay. Um, standards. Um, right, so you have, you know, in the, you have yeah, the I'm issue with the accessory structures in figure 3 07, in that, you know, porches. <coughs> Um, even if this counted as a deck, the is it three or two dash oh seven? It's sorry, so it's on page three dash eight, so it's figure three dash oh seven under section three zero zero three. Yep. So even as a deck, your minimum allowed rear or side setback is still five feet. Okay. And for A waiver of a side setback, your maximum waiver limit is not less than five feet. There's just no, at least administratively on my part, I see no way to allow, they don't allow something closer than five feet from the right. side setback, from the side, from the property line, side property line. So if I could just restate that to make sure I understand it. The, when you say the maximum is five feet, you mean that any waiver cannot let something get closer, closer. than five feet right. to the property line. Right. That's the way it I read this. It does not mean that we're talking about five feet here or five feet there. Right. Okay. And this is just for waiver as opposed to a, um, a variant. Right, but a variance would be based on the physical nature of the property and having no, I believe it's reasonable use of the property. We've, we've, uh, 
we've done some creative analysis in the past. My understanding is that was under the old regulations where you didn't have specific waivers. I, I yeah, but the sure. variance was, uh, I mean, that's set by statute. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay. So the question is, I mean, th so the actual portion of the house is already existing. Mm -hmm. That's not seeking the waiver. The question is, does this s small five feet by how how deep is the porch? Five. Five by six. Okay, so really, five feet by five feet, twenty-five square feet. Uh, actually, a little less than that because uh, we are some amount back from the property line there, so it was probably more like five feet by three feet or four feet, I'm not sure. Okay. In, that, in that area. You talk, sorry, Dan, are you talking about the the current the total size of the entire structure? Mm -hmm. Well, no, the just the just. The what well, we're focused on with the waiver, which is the, you know, I want to make sure that we isolate what we're not looking at, which would be the building, and then the portion of the porch, the only portion of the porch, porch that we're really talking about is this little 15 square feet. 15 square feet. Mm -hmm. um, okay. We're two feet away from the property line. Thank you. Um, yeah. So... So long. Go ahead. Um, is that approximate or is that an unknown fixed line? That is approximate. Okay. It's, it's no um, less than two feet, or it is. You know, we. It is no plus or minus two feet. Okay. <laughs> so it's essentially based on what we what we found from the city, and then my repeated conversations with the neighbor Steve Rivellini, um, that both understand it to be the property line being at the center of the tree that uh, is we both understood to be the point at which my property becomes his property and, and we went through uh, I forget the word I'm looking for but we went through records and and you know and you know plotted the property pro pl plotted the property corners uh, based on based on those To me, this is still we're still there's there's a pre-existing non-conforming structure there now that's going to be removed and replaced with a much smaller enclosed porch. The whole approval of this will decrease the level of non-conformity, and as such, I don't even know that we need to grant a waiver. Also, I'm looking at the non-conformity section, 1203E provides that a non-conforming structure may be a large enlarged or expanded without waiver or variance provided the addition does not encroach beyond the existing non-conforming building line which this deck would not with regard to that side yard setback um, so I don't I, I'm not I'm not inclined to worry about granting a yeah. waiver or uh, anything else and and as one board member I'm happy to approve this without as as presented without any of these other hoops that we might try to jump through <laughs> and certainly without requiring them to cut off three feet of deck to, to tuck it back in f from the existing property line right. mm -hmm. I, I have a hard time re viewing it as an existing nonconformity because it doesn't exist the, the porch it does not exist wait but, but the house does the, the so house are, is, so is, is the porch an extension of the nonconformity a non-conforming house. Even a new That's structure you can expand about. onto a non-conformity such so long as the addition does not encroach beyond the existing non-conforming building line. Okay, thank you. So you're you're, <coughs> you're building off the non-conformity that is the house. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, Ryan. I missed that one. That makes sense. Well, <coughs> that's much easier. <laughs> well, I, I, I think I think I think uh, Ryan's on the right track. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's important for us to explore these. Yep. Uh, uh, new aspects of the, of the new ordinance, but uh, I don't know if we need to carry that through and accomplish anything. Nope. I, I, I'm, I'm perfectly happy substituting Ryan's analysis for this whole waiver, because I think, yeah. uh, you know, a part of what I was wrestling with was that I think the waiver makes sense, as, as, as Kate was starting to suggest, when you have the 
completely new structure. Yes. And we can waive some of the setbacks, but only so far, because that's when you have total control over where you're planning to situate this. Um, whereas here, we're talking about an extension of a non-conforming structure, which is just the classic problem we've always dealt with. This yeah. is board where we have a garage that sits on the, on the boundary line mm -hmm. that somebody wants to build a second floor to or, you know, to continue to have a reasonable use of it. All right. Well, let's move on. Um, Sorry so to have complicated that one. No, no. That's, this is how we learn. <laughs> apologize to everyone sitting here as we stumble in through some of these newer provisions. So then you have the coverage, which okay. I believe, I'm hoping applicants have some new data for, so they should, we should get the new data for can them, I, the exact measurements. Yes. Please. Dan, if you just want to, for the record, go sure. through this. Sure. So I took um, Meredith's template, which I appreciated it being organized as it, as it was in, in this document, in the staff prepared document, um, and dialed in the numbers so that they were, that they were more, 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 more accurate. Um, so we've calculated that the total square footage of the lot is that top number, 4,687. Um, when we combine the footprint of the house and all area that consists of the driveway, the front walkway, and all parking areas, um, total 2,860 square feet. Based on the 4,678 square feet of the parcel, 70% um, of that would be 70%, which is my understanding of what we're allowed to take up some take up with is is 3,275 square feet um, we are proposing oh I'm sorry there's a typo in there isn't it yep that's that, if that that second number that line down towards the bottom that's supposed to be 2,860 to be consistent with that upper number right. um, at 2,860 square feet I believe we're within the allowable percentage right. of coverage the building footprint includes the front porch. It's the existing front porch? Yes, existing front porch. I don't I don't believe I did include that front porch with the and that you and if that's an error, mm -hmm. I mean I guess you know, I guess it's perhaps it should. I guess it, in my mind feet. it was a little maybe that that, that was unclear. Yeah. But I still think even if I am confident that even if we were to include that front porch, we would still be within we would still be within that that seventy that seventy uh, percent because the the front porch is probably less than thirty feet long and less than ten feet deep, right? It is abs it is absolutely less than those numbers that you just said. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because that's what you basically are working with is three hundred, right? Three or four hundred extra. Okay, that mm -hmm. answers my question. Mm -hmm. Four hundred and fifteen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. So I think we can at this point move on to the DRC comments. Um, and the DRC found this by a vote of 5-0 to be acceptable, um, but they had, it looks like, approximately four recommendations uh, that uh, they recommend one of four options for the front south facing door. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, and were those out of four options that presented to them for the front those were the four options that the DRC provided to the applicants is what was acceptable to the DRC. Oh, okay. Because the, the applicants were going to just replace the front door. Okay. Um, and so the DRC had some specifics with what they would like to see that actually replaced. Oh, with. okay, okay, I see, sorry. So one is the repair, reconstruct the existing double doors. Uh, the other is to repair or reconstruct and attach existing double doors so they function as a single door. Uh, the third was to replace the front double doors with a new single 42-inch door with an appearance and profile which matches. Um, 
design of the existing double doors, um, and four to replace the existing double with new in kind. Uh, recommend not changing the single window on the south face of the attic level. Uh, alternative single window on the south face of the attic. Uh, sorry. It's also, also. Oh, do you have a type? Oh. Yeah, I have a little type so it's easier to read. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> gibberish to me. Um, You're trying to read Steve's handwriting. <laughs> I am trying to read Steve's handwriting. Okay, so not changing the single window on the south face of the attic level. The alternative recommended is to add either A, an additional skylight on the east or west side of the roof, or B, increase the size of the existing skylight with either a fixed or operable skylight. Um, and then I think the third was raising roof support brace for the rear porch to allow headroom for accessibility. Uh, now, were you acceptable to all those changes? Have you made a decision on the front south-facing door? Mm -hmm. Number three. Number three, which has replaced the front double door with a single 42-inch door mm -hmm. with an appearance and profile which matches the design of the existing double doors. Yeah. Just okay. Can I just ask a question out of curiosity? Yeah. Were you able to, was the gentleman that was recommended to you to build that? No, that no. was, that wasn't relevant to me because we do that. So okay. We oh, will great. Build yeah. That. So, but you, that it made sense to build it yourself. So yes. cool. That's awesome. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask a clarifying question on one of the um, design review committee's recommendations, and that's um, number two about the single window on the south face of the attic level. Um, it, su it says that alternatives could, that it, it recommends skylights as alternatives, and was it your sense from the DRC that that was optional, that you would not be required to put in a skylight? They were just thinking with us about, since they if kind you of more take it the way, they were trying to okay. um, add back in should okay. it be desirable. Because I wouldn't want you to be required to put in a skylight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There will be no additional skylights. All right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It makes no difference Probably to me. I just want you to have a best decision you'll ever make Thank with you. a house in Vermont. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. All right. And then uh, the roof support brace raising that, is that something that you're, sure. is yep. it, you're amenable to? Uh, doesn't cause radical changes? No. During design review, was that it was determined that there will be new lights on the back, so lighting is discussed further on in here um, to, right. to get some details on that. But the, the DRC was happy with giving the um, applicant options for either a recessed light in the ceiling of the porch or something on, on like a wall sconce back there. Either one was fine, especially because it's on the back of the building. Right. Okay. Uh, any questions for the board about those? On the demolition. One staff comment is about erosion control. Um, where the project doesn't disturb an area greater than 10,000 square feet, so no erosion control is plan is required. But the staff recommends that the board include a condition of approval requiring the applicant to follow erosion control practices as outlined in our bylaws. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that a condition that's acceptable to yes, you? Absolutely. Uh, I think it is important in this respect because obviously. As the melt comes and as the work starts mm -hmm. and the demolition off mm -hmm. of the cliff, there may be some issues. And I know having walked down Court Street, the way water flows off of the properties mm -hmm. is, does have a direct impact onto those streets. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And then uh, Department of Public Works reviewed the application and indicated no concerns regarding the plans as presented. Um, uh, we have a requirement to determine whether the project complies with stormwater management. Is This is hooked up to, um, there are storm sewers and other drainage improvements that are, there's no, I'm sorry, there's no drainage or stormwater improvements that are being proposed in this project, right? That's correct. Okay. But this is a property that's served already by storm sewers along the street um, on a relatively small lot. 
Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, so the question is, do we uh, do we find that complies with 3009 for stormwater, given that the Director of Public Works finds it in no issues? Good. Let's see. All right. Sorry, guys, just sort of a technicality. Um, <laughs> no, this is... This is um, so one thing that I did not see, and I'm happy to understand if I missed it, you've talked about adding parking spaces along the back there. Is that part of this application now? Have you outlined? It's, it's in, yeah, it's, oh, in, the, it's in the site plan. I missed that. Um, this shows, uh, so that's all detailed. That's why I, it all seems to comply. Okay. Um, so I put that all in here, but there's no red because oh, I, see I didn't parking. find any okay. issues. Sorry. It's okay. I missed. Okay. So parking one, two, and three, you've got the snow storage area marked. Mm -hmm approximate line of the ledge. Great. Any questions from the board? All right. Um, so we find that the parking uh, conforms to the requirements. Um, they're past the front line of the building. The use is residential, so the one per unit standard is met. This is a minor site plan. One question that we do ask people, however, is uh, bicycle access and circulation. Is there a spot for bicycle storage planned for the, the property? Uh, yes, and, okay. and, and hopefully uh, we could use the full length of the porch in between the back porch, in between the door and the, and the end of the porch, because uh, my bicycle will fit by six inches the plans as they are. Okay. Well, with an extra 15 feet. Yeah. Good thing we didn't so, raise the porch. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, the front porch could also be used for bicycle storage, but more likely the back porch. All right. So uh, no landscaping is proposed. Um, and I'm skipping over the other most of the other pieces that are largely acceptable, such as sidewalks, pedestrian circulation, as an in as an in city lot. Um, so we're still working with three two o three G landscaping. Is yes, we're still working with it. Huh. I'll, trust me, I'll let you guys know as soon as if hopefully City Council approves the interim adoption of a new landscaping provision. So this is this is a new provision. Um, and it talks about site landscaping. It requires one shrub for every five feet of building perimeter and one tree for every 30 feet of exterior, principal building exterior. Um, and so Meredith, Meredith has done some calculations based on the scale. The not including the barn or storage area is approximately 168 feet. Uh, so uh, wait a minute, how do we, yeah, 33.6 shrubs and 5.6 trees. I, I, if we got down to it, I was going to let you guys decide if you were going to round those up or not. Sorry. <laughs> round it up. Oh, no. <laughs> we might as well round them up before oh, we no, no. Them. round them up I, to zero. I want <laughs> six-tenths of a shrub <laughs> and six-tenths of a tree. Um, so you haven't proposed, do you have any rough count as to what's existing on your property? As far as trees and shrubs go, yes. Okay. Um, there is one large tree in the front. There are approximately fifty small trees in the back that are all on the slope that are on my property. All the all the little volunteers growing up in the crevices and cracks. Yes. Okay. Um, and I, I know that we have a definition of shrub. But do I remember correctly that there is extensive <coughs> landscaping in the front in the form of say lilies, black eyed Susans, or both? This house is somewhat well known for its rather wild I flower. Like it. I like it. That was a compliment. Putting the wild in the wild flower mm -hmm. front yard. Yeah. So perennials. Yes. Yep. Large number of perennials. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, you know, one 
one of the ways we've gotten to work with this landscaping and screen, screening is that it talks about the purpose. And I'll just simply read this. Um, I think it's, it's important, although we have, as a board, heard it many times. Oh, you got it. In brief, it's there. Trust me, I, yeah. I keep putting that in every time we have to go through this so landscaping provision. So the purpose of this section is to protect the quality of life and community character by, one, enhancing the appearance of the built environment as viewed from public vantage points, creating shade along sidewalks and walkways within parking lots, providing landscape buffers between residential and non-residential land uses, and screening land uses and development to create visual clutter and distraction. And you know, one purpose that's stated in sort of the longer definition is that it, this is not meant to hide um, houses or developments. It's not to create like the cedar screen that your neighbors down the street used to have. Um, it's intended to enhance and to soften. Uh, and so is there room in the front yard for another tree or would that crowd your existing tree and gardens? There is room for several more small trees in the front yard okay. or one large or one larger tree. But actually trees aren't the issue because you have the 50 in back, right? I Yes, that's my count. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, I mean, you only have to get f to 5.6, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I think I'm splitting hairs between what is a tree and what is a twig. <laughs> are on its way to being a full tree uh, on some of those. but uh, I mean, I, I, I'm just looking, and uh, again, this is, I think, what we're trying to do, and we're not trying to play games necessarily, but we're trying to understand, you know, it, this section here really talks about the um, enhancing this appearance and, and um, you know, Generally, landscaping should be designed to fit into and enhance the site's natural features and setting landscape plans that feature a mix of plant material arranged in informally shaped and space groupings are strongly encouraged. So, I mean, what you're saying is you have a tree in the front yard, you have extensive perennial gardens in the front yard. In the back, you have <coughs> more wild growth, picturesque as it would be. They have leaves. Um, and they have leaves and they have, you know, but they grow, they only grow to a certain size and then the rocky soil limits them. Um, okay, Do, any questions yeah, from anyone? Mr. Chair, I was just wondering, we, we're trying to meet the intent of, of creating an improved environment yeah. type of situation through landscaping. And I, perhaps we could, we could uh, approach this a somewhat different way, which would be to, to uh, say that the, uh, applicant has provided uh, evidence of uh, existing landscape which meets the intent of the ordinance and uh, that the board uh, is approving the, exi the, the application with the existing landscaping and no further landscaping is necessary and we can cr create that as a waiver if necessary or some other, I mean, the, it's, just, it's also right. a way to, to add a level of practicality to an ongoing discussion, right? No, I, th I think, and and uh, I think that's well phrased, Kevin. Um, and I think that's where I'm edging towards. Um, so succinctly put, that's fine with me. Good. All right. So let's move on. Um, when we talk about outdoor lighting, um, which is what we started to talk about earlier. Is there a proposal for your outdoor lighting? We don't have light fixtures specified, but would be more than happy to comply with the standards that are presented here. Okay. Uh, so, um, really if the, there were. Oh, yeah. So, really, the, the lumen and the energy star yep. requirements. Understood. Mm -hmm. yeah. Will be fully shielded. Pardon? The lights will be fully shielded. Oh. Is that. Is that um, is if that's a required? Oh, right. No. Um, yes. Okay. I mean, one thing is that where it's situated underneath the porch roof may affect how it's shielded, yeah. right? Um, so, as I understand, the DRC's concern or, or allowance was either recessed lighting or a sconce, and you're comfortable with that. 
under the under the portrait. Okay. Yes. Um, all right. So a condition that they they comply with the Energy Star shielding and lumen requirements is acceptable. All right. I don't know if I have any more questions. I can always create more. Um, but it, we have uh, a couple of different things. So we've got minor site plan review, which we've conducted, design review, which we've conducted, demolition of a contributing structure review. So there's three of those. Um, I would propose we make three separate motions. Um, and I would suggest we start with the demolition of the contributing structure. So who wants to make the motion? I'll move that we approve the demolition of a portion of a contributing structure as presented in the application. Okay, motion by Ryan. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Second by Rob. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. Okay. I'll take a motion about design review that would incorporate the uh, conditions that the applicant has said they're amenable to. Mr. Chair, I move design review approval at 27 Court Street with the following conditions. The applicant shall choose from one of the following options regarding the front south facing door. Is it necessary to list them? No. As recommended by the design review committee. Um, the next condition is that the applicant shall leave a single wi window on the south elevation of the third floor. Instead of the proposed additional small windows, the applicant may add a second skylight on the roof on the east or west side or increase the size of the existing skylight. Um, the next condition is that the applicant shall raise the bottom connection location of the rear port, rear port roof support to allow headroom underneath for accessibility. Um, and as well as the last condition pertaining to outdoor lighting as recommended by the Design Review Committee. Okay. Motion by Kate. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Kevin. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. All right, and minor site plan review. And I think we'll have to include the conditions in regards to the erosion control. Yeah, I'll make a motion that we approve uh, the application uh, for minor site plan approval with the condition that the applicant shall follow the erosion control practices outlined in section 3008B of the regulations. Okay. That is the only condition. Second. Motion by Ryan, second by Kevin. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. All right. You have preliminary approval. And just so you know, um, that, of course, is subject to the 30-day window once the decision issues in its written form. Um, but you have nothing more for us tonight unless you wish anything else. Thank you all for your yeah. thoughtful consideration. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for your patience. Mr. Chair, may I request a two-minute break? All right. Let's take a, a quick two-minute break. But if the second applicants of the evening want to come forward and get set up.
All right. Ready to go back on? All right. Thank you all very much. We're back on the record here at the Development Review Board. Um, sir, if you'll introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Samuel Nuara. Okay, uh, Mr. Nuara. Um, we're going to do sketch plan reviews. So just so you understand, we're not going to put you under oath. Um, mm -hmm. This is really an initial r opportunity for us to ask questions, for you to present your subdivision plans. Um, nothing we we don't determine anything that's binding tonight. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity for us to say, for us to raise questions or issues that we think you may have to address going forward and to get a general sense of your application mm -hmm. um, so that when you do the, do the final subdivision, um, you have the benefit of this opportunity to have sort of vetted through some of these issues. Um, is anyone else here to be heard on this particular application, uh, sketch plan review? Okay. To listen. <laughs> so just if you could indicate to me if you have any if you have any feedback, it's a very informal process, but I would ask you to step up to the microphone when you do if you do want to speak. I mean, if you're here to just simply listen, that's fine as well. Obviously, as I said, you know nothing tonight is decided. It's just simply an opportunity to listen or hear. But if part of what you're hearing has a concern for you or you mm. think needs to be addressed. Um, one, you can raise it to the board tonight um, to put it on our radar um, to the extent that our bylaws would consider it. Um, but two, it's always a good opportunity then if you have a concern that you think the applicant can meet by making alterations or changes to start that conversation. So I'll simply put that out there as a way of trying to help foster a successful application process. So Meredith, do you want to give us just a quick overview? Of sketch plan in general? No, of, of this particular application. I just wanted to make sure. Um, so this is a fairly basic, to me, two-lot subdivision of a residential parcel, um, such that the new parcel won't have any structures on it. All of the current structures will remain on um, you know, the initial lot. Um, there's a few factual matters that I've highlighted in here that the applicant needs to clarify. Mm -hmm. Some of them are minor, like whether or not um, you know, utilities will be underground. One of the, the, you know, biggest items, I think, for the applicant to get feedback from you on is whether or not you have any thoughts about driveway possibilities. The current, you know, they've, they've included a potential, um, uh, you know, house and driveway in here just to show that it's, it's doable, that it can meet the, um, a zoning permit requirement later on. Um, and the, you know, the potential space for a driveway is, is pretty small. It meets the requirements. Um, that was one of the Department of Public Works issues too, just because it is a very, it's a small parcel. Um, but in, in general, there's, there's not major issues that I have seen. Um, you know, a few, few notes for final subdivision application and things to include or things not to include, such as the, the house outline. One question along those lines, um, as I'm looking at the, the sketch in back, uh, the blue dotted lines, is that the building envelope? Uh, that's, there's, there's like a, a red highlighted that looks like the boundary. There's a footprint of a proposed house. But then. Yes. Yeah. So the, the, the black sort of dotted line, I'm just mm -hmm. trying to understand, because one of the issues about the, the driveway might be uh, ameliorated by pushing the house a little bit further back on it, the lot. It is going to go further back. This was, um, 
you know, we've been going back and forth with uh, the architects, and that was one of the first things that I discussed with them when they brought this to me, because part of the main issue is going forward, not just to address the, the driveway, but, you know, our intention is to make it fit as well as possible within the existing space. Mm -hmm. and when you're actually there and look at it, pushing it back will allow better sight lines for everybody and avoid more of kind of a cramped, you know, look. So that driveway right. issue, I think, will more than be addressed. Okay. And that would be at the zoning permit Correct. stage yeah, versus that's much later, the final. But just, right. Yeah. right. I think it's just, it, it, and I understand that you're not proposing a house or specific development, but I think um, illustrating that often is a way of sure. meeting these concerns because um, you know, obviously driveways are a necessity and likely in a house like this to have more than one car. Um, and while, you know, we don't have to permit, I mean, we don't have a requirement to show more than one car, showing that adequate space sure. is, is helpful. Okay. Um, so was there any sort of initial uh, direction you wanted to show us for this two-lot uh, subdivision? No, I think it was pretty um, self-explanatory as far as, you know, the sizing issue, trying mm -hmm. to get them uh, relatively even um, because you want everything to to fit as well as possible within the existing community, you know, without it, uh, you know, with it, uh, avoiding any major issues for anybody in the surrounding area. So, so let me jump then to some of the uh, the questions that that the staff has raised mm -hmm. that I think are, are relevant. One is we've talked about the driveway, um, the utilities. Will those be underground? Um, if, if that's a requirement of the, I mean, I'm more than willing to meet any potential requirement mm -hmm. that's proposed, obviously. I'm trying to remember, Meredith, is, is that on this yeah. street, underground utilities, is it? Uh, just in subdivisions in general. In general okay. New subdivisions. The request is that utilities be underground. We're trying not to add. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, if there's a, if there's a line, you, you'd want to go underground probably from the nearest place that. Yeah, under from the street to the house. Okay. If there's already a mm -hmm. line at the street. Okay. I just I I haven't I haven't driven down here with that in mind. <laughs> okay. Well again that's um, if that's something you're amenable to. Yeah. Um, I mean if that's what it if that's what it takes. <coughs> I'm sure right. there's a way. I'm sure. sure there's a way to get it done. I, it's, it's, I know I can it's a requirement. It's like they yeah. shall be located underground unless prevented yeah. by ledge or other physical conditions. Okay. No, there's, uh, there's, I mean, it's just on a regular street. I'm yeah, sure there's a way just to, although the poles are on the other side, um, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking of it now because the one runs to the existing house and then runs to the neighbor on the other side. It, I think it, it would have to be. It would be helpful before your final subdivision is just to maybe inquire, not we're not looking for a commitment or anything like mm -hmm. that, but um, it's helpful to us as we're making this decision if there is an impediment um, or something that would limit um, to raise that now just so mm -hmm. we know that that is a restriction. Um, you either can or cannot meet it, um, and that's that's helpful. Um, so I would, I would look a little bit closer, you know, and I don't know if that's a matter of talking to your you've hired an architect or an engineer yeah. um, to have them have that conversation or they may be able to direct you to the utility company who mm -hmm. would be able to, because really what we're talking about is, you know, your electric and your uh, phone and, and cable. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are what run off of the utility lines. I presume you'll have either a propane or oil system for heating, uh, so it's not as if it's running off the street. You're it would be, this is served by city sewer and water, mm -hmm. um, but that's already underground. Um, except for those of us who have fountains. Um, yeah, the only issue I can see is that the poles are on the other side of the street, so I'm sure there's some right. 
I'm not sure how that would work going on well, ground underneath. The how is the existing house served? Um, From across the... It, so the wire comes across the street correct, above yeah. this, above mm -hmm. the street. So the question is, can it be run off of, you know, what, you know, and that, that's a, I think that's an important question, in part because these are relatively new, these requirements mm -hmm. for running underground utilities. So it's helpful for us to understand. It, it's not as if six other lots on your street have done this and have all run it Correct. underground. Um, sorry, you're the canary in the coal mine. <laughs> Yeah, but well. it may also be, you know, coming down to our office to have a little discussion and bringing Department of Public Works into it. Yeah. Yep. And just to make sure that, you know, you know where all the potential, you know, sewer and water connections are for the uh, new lot as well as mm -hmm. the electric. And, you know, I'll, you and I can walk walk through some of this together because a lot of times for, for subdivisions, I've been lucky enough to have engineers on board. And so they just give me this lovely survey with everything already on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't have to go and the applicant find it okay, but we'll, I'm happy we'll to help do. you with that one too so, so one oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say what's the uh, the area of the existing lot and what are the two proposed lots the existing uh, the existing now what well, was previously I actually just finished um, a survey so some of the numbers would change but the existing now is Fifteen thousand four hundred thirty-eight. Okay, yeah, I see that. Um, so the proposed uh, there's one that'll be sixty-four hundred approximately, and then lot two will be uh, approximately nine thousand. Nine thousand. Yeah. And I, I would just observe as we're all getting to know the new zoning regulations that the minimum, the new minimum lot size in, in this area is three thousand square mm -hmm. feet. So the new lot That's is two tough. lots. Yep. According to the zoning. And it's actually um, slightly bigger. <coughs> when it comes to the next application, yeah. some of those numbers are going to change and they're going to yeah. get, get so slightly larger. So. Okay. Um, covered the driveway. Mm -hmm. The um, one thing that the staff has noted is that there's a, a Chapter 350 subdivision standards. And these really are the sections about capacity of community facilities and utilities. It says the applicant shall demonstrate that the proposed subdivision shall not cause disproportionate or unreasonable burden on the city's ability to provide community facilities and utilities, including local schools, police fire protection, ambulance service, street infrastructure and maintenance, park and recreation facilities, water supply, sewage disposal, stormwater systems, infrastructure, solid waste disposal, services and facilities. In, I don't, and then it, it has other sections such as suitability of the land, uh, traffic, uh, design, configuration, and parcel boundaries. These are just things that I think your application is going to have to touch upon just to answer um, or be prepared to testify to mm -hmm. why they don't. I mean, I can say the capacity commute facilities I just listed off. I, I list them off because I, I don't think this, this application touches upon any of those it's an infill it's existing within the city limits it's in a tight tighter urban area um, you know it's not going to um, you're not going to bring in th 300 kids that will change how the school functions you're not forcing police to go in an area where they don't usually patrol or mm -hmm. fire for that sake it's there's no park or it's not going to impinge upon the gateway to a park area you know those kind of things but just having those answers and there's a number of sections in here um, so that just take a look and I think mm -hmm. a brief narrative Meredith can certainly help you um, address those but we'll obviously be looking at, at those as we go into the final subdivision yeah. if I may add, yeah. um, by brief narrative sometimes people will just take this list of what's in section chapter 350 subdivision standards and mm -hmm. for each of the standards in order to list the standard and how you met it list the state. so it can really just be okay. that simple yeah. typed up for us to review we have use. some templates oh great we have templates okay. <laughs> <Sorry. Yep. laughs> um, and then the one of the last there's a few more but uh, the existing uh, mature trees on the lot um, whether or not this your proposed development is going to affect uh, those trees um, and you may
may want to um, provide information about potential privacy for screening. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of the rare flat open areas mm -hmm. in Montpelier um, where you don't have a cliff providing natural screening, mm -hmm. um, such as the last applicant. Um, so certainly how you, understanding that you don't have to propose actual landscaping, but addressing it would be helpful to identify what the trees are or you know where the, the sort of landscaping exists currently, um, as well as identifying areas where such screening could exist to prevent, um, you know, suddenly. Uh, I'll use as an example that worked on a house once when I was a landscaper that just sat out like a big open house in a farm field with no landscaping anywhere near it. Um, and I think we try to avoid that because we don't want that kind of sore thumb architecture. We want it to sort of blend into the neighborhood, and this is an existing neighborhood with mature trees mm -hmm. and transitions between, and that's really what we talked about in the last applicant is, you know, making sure that the landscaping helps those transitions. So identifying those areas will be helpful. Uh, just one, one quick thing. That tree in this picture no longer exists. Okay. I, I don't know when this picture was taken, and I just got here last summer, and I've never seen it, so... I don't know at what point it was taken out, but it's the grass yep. has grown over, so it's been a while. It's I, I don't know, but well, that one is, is no longer there. This is just a Google Maps image. I don't have time to drive around to every single house yeah. to get an application. Yeah, no, I'm just pointing it out. So so thank you. No, you know, thank you. Yeah, there's two. There was one. There's one here, and then you'll see on some of the drawings. There's one major one uh, that's actually the boundary line on the other house. Right, and, and, and that and, one's staying, obviously, but. And I, I think that's just what you know, I, I don't feel a need to necessarily get into at this point, a uh, lengthy discussion about the landscaping, but I think for the final, Correct. just to have yeah. that in indication yep. so Understood. that, um, the, and I think that obviously, you know, frankly, a lot of these things help neighbors understand too mm -hmm. how this house is going to look, you know, as, as in Phil, is it going to disrupt um, what's an existing sort of flow between mm -hmm. the houses or is it going to fit in as as the zoning regulations intend this type of infill too which is to be of a piece so that when somebody moves in like you did it, they won't they won't say well where's that where'd the house come from mm -hmm. or you know Understood. I just want to note there is something that in editing I failed to put in red at the top of page 13 um, when we're considering the renewable energy and energy conservation issues. Um, there is a requirement that um, you not be impinging on, generally it says with appropriate protection for each lot's solar access within the subdivision. Um, I, because I know this might have been a, an issue, I kind of went a little step further in that on page 13, if you look and considering the way everything is oriented, a new house in between 19 Pearl Street and 27 Pearl Street could potentially have some solar impacts on the neighbor on 27 Pearl Street. That picture is shown with the north-south yeah, yeah. vertical orientation. So just something to think about, mm -hmm. even though I know it's not the lot within the, quote, within the subdivision. I, yeah. I think these, our current subdivision regulations are really written for larger multi-lot subdivisions, not two-lot subdivisions in Phil. Yep. I would agree with that. Um, so, in that case, this calls for appropriate protections for each lot solar access, and appropriateness may take into consideration the fact that it's in Phil and in yep. a clean neighborhood. And but it's something for you guys to consider when right. the regulations don't quite necessarily apply to the situation. Oh, I, I'm saying that they could be... Yep, you, but you'll need to interpret them protections with that would way. would be interpretable. Right. Right. But definitely something for you to interpret, not me. Yep. <laughs> well, well, I'm always happy to interpret. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, do you have any questions about about that? I mean, no. you know, part of I, it is, um, you know, if you think about like light trespass, mm -hmm. you know, you, you can't build big imposing structure that casts a giant shadow on 27 Pearl Street. Um, I and I think that's very similar to the way in which the solar. 
because if a solar array is on a roof and you build something that's going to mm -hmm. overshadow. Um, but at the same time, you know, part of this is just, and again, I think this is where, you know, if there's concerns raised, shifting building back and forth, mm -hmm. you, you, it seems, I think you have some play in where the proposed house yeah, could we, be. We, we do. Okay. Um, and then I think the other, the only other staff comment was really about um, uh, whether or not there was a survey of the existing parcel in it. Did you say that there was a survey? Okay, great. Fresh off the presses. Excellent. So I think that um, that will take care of that issue. Um, but moving away from the staff report, um, are there any questions from other board members as to concerns about this two lot subdivision? Any questions? Well, I, I just we had a discussion about the utilities and that underground and that maybe something that could be identified on the plat is mm -hmm. what sort of rights exist, um, you know, if any, to for utilities access to the parcel if, 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 if that's determined that. Or, you know, well, that, that's actually a great point, and I think that's that wasn't expressly said, but I'm glad it was. Which is, you know, obviously that impacts how these two parcels relate. If there's a need for utility easement across parcel, what what you're describing as lot two which is the existing house mm -hmm. to, to benefit lot one. Um, you know, that's one way to, um, that, that will be helpful to uh, identify that, whether there's going to be a need for one. Because if there is, we don't scrutinize the language of the easement, but we do require it. Um, and if we require it to a certain satisfaction so that we can review and approve it. Okay. Um, great. Any other questions? Any questions from the public or comments or feedback? Great. So from here, we don't take a vote or make any decisions. You've gotten some feedback from us. Um, and really, I would characterize it in terms of just more detail um, and sure. addressing some of these looser issues. Um, I'm not seeing any any setback issues or boundary or size Yeah, issues. some of that was, you know, it, some of the further details were you know, had to wait for the survey sure. you know, and go forward with the architects and so on. I think any... Any questions for us this morning? Not at this time. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next applicants, please come forward. Come on down. Rod Roddy used to say. Price is right. He was the announcer on the Price is Right. I know. He was the host. I think Rod Roddy may have done. Or retired. Yeah. I, it, neither, neither being ill or, yeah. What's that? Um, <laughs> or unemployed. <laughs> I, I have not watched a price of right now. It sure isn't. That's too many. Yeah. A couple times. Do, 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 do everything. Drew Carey, Drew Carey really, you know. He does. He's picked up the mantle. He has a, does he have the long, thin microphone? The Bob Barker microphone. Yeah, he does. Excellent. All right. Please, introduce yourselves. Matt Wamsky is from Global Partners. And uh, Jeff Bolesky with Catamount Consulting Engineers. Great. So raise your right hands. We're going to put you under oath. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth <coughs> under the pains and penalties of perjury. I do. Very good. Um, actually, I'm going to have you guys just jump right into it. I think that's. Yeah, you guys are all. Yeah. Yeah. Lead us down the path, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so very similar uh, application we've submitted to the uh, 367 River Street project with Connors last month in that we've got a previously approved uh, site plan development for a new gas station uh, mm -hmm. that was approved in 06 or, or 16 or 17 and where essentially the property has been buyed out by a new ownership group and they're just looking to make some very minor uh, renovations to the approved plan. Uh, as such, in our discussions uh, with staff, um, 
we've made this application and attempting to permit these, this uh, amendment to the previous permit. Uh, so we're back to a situation where we're still reviewing under the old regulations. Um, so all the plans, the development plans that are presented to the board um, still relate to those zoning requirements. Um, so if it pleases the board, I'm happy to, to provide a, a brief rundown of the, the changes that we've done since the previous approval. If that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so similar to what we've done, we've taken the proposed site plan, and again, we're talking about the uh, existing Curly uh, Fuel Gas Service Station um, on Route Two, um, and three sixty-six. I think he's my play road. Sorry, Jeff. Just yeah. just so we understand, this is uh, you have a uh, sheet number C two. I do. I have C2. Uh, and that's the one with bubbles, again, that exactly. show us. It's, uh, so kind of C2.0, the Rev 4, with a small date, 1919, um, that has your parking, your 1919 revision references with the bubbles around the different changes that they're making. This is going to be the one you're probably going to want to refer to through most of this. Right. I've included everything, but this is the one that really helps. Right. So similar to before, we provided the existing conditions plan as the site still operates now. We provided the proposed condition site plan, um, and then we've also done the proposed site plan with these revisions to kind of annotate what the changes were that we're proposing. Um, but I do have a full plan set here if anybody wants to look at the existing conditions. Um, I also brought another big one. Yeah, so, um, but I think everybody's probably familiar with the property right now. I mean, there's right. um, you know, three structures there now. There's a small gas station with a canopy. There's the kind of mixed use. Um, so right now, there's, in the middle, there's kind of the existing canopy that's along the front edge. There's a mixed-use office building um, on the south side of the property. And there's that kind of large storage uh, barn in the, in the back of the property now. And uh, as previous before, the, the design plans call for the removal of everything, essentially, and reconstruction uh, with a new um, proposed uh, gas service station building, convenience store, uh, small deli inside, and then uh, canopy located to the north of the proposed building. Um, the building footprint and location have not changed at all. Uh, the general overall uh, access, flow, um, you know, the majority of the utilities have not changed. So the, really the, um, the changes, I think, are relatively minor and more utility-oriented uh, than anything. But um, again, I'll just run through them really quick. I think the, the primary one or the biggest change um, is probably the one that may get discussed the most tonight is we've relocated the fuel pumps and canopy uh, I'm not sure who here on the board was part of that original review and process, but right now there's an existing canopy. Um, so this being the front property line or the right-of-way line, and back in 2011 regulations, there was a 50-foot front yard requirement. So this setback line here actually bifurcates uh, a large portion of the existing canopy out there right now. So that the whole existing canopy was more or less non-conforming. Um, as part of that review process back then, essentially it was determined that we could not remove that canopy and rebuild it even if we were making it less non-conforming and that we actually had to just maintain it or truncate it and add on to the back end of it in order for um, it to be allowed to be grandfathered in, so to speak. And um, based on conversations with staff and the uh, desires of the new ownership of the property, that existing canopy structure is just uh, unsalvageable, um, financially unreasonable, doesn't, I mean, it's just not good practice to build something that's kind of falling down anyway. So what we're proposing now is the removal of that canopy and then sh uh, the new canopy to be built substantially further back. And I'm guessing we're talking maybe another 15 to 20 feet further back from the property line, um, although it still would not fully comply with the old zoning regulations in that uh, the new canopy would, would still stick out into the front yard setback. Um, I believe staff did note or comment, though, that the new front yard setback for the zoning district, for what that's worth, it would comply. Mm -hmm. I think it's a 20 or 30 foot front yard setback now. Um, so if we were looking at today's zoning regulations, it would comply. So we just shifted this back and, and reconfigured the pumps, and, and we, didn't, we weren't uh, bound by needing to work off of the existing stanchions and the structure layout of that canopy. And it just freed us up to, to use the space more effectively and efficiently. Um, the second change was just the relocation of the underground fuel storage tanks. Uh, we shifted these to the north and kind of get them out of the majority of the uh, 
um, driving course of, of the general public that'll be using both the standard canopy and the parking along the, the building frontages. Um, change three involved uh, the relocation. We had three landscaping new deciduous trees planned along the north property line here and to accommodate both the, the new underground storage tanks and still provide the, what we thought was a requisite amount of snow storage. We just shifted these a little bit in location. Uh, same number, same area of the property just shifted. Uh, same thing with the uh, dumpster enclosure. Um, and, and we can talk a little bit more about this because um, I think there was a staff comment on it. But this uh, still fenced uh, trash recycling enclosure was just a little further shifted to the north on previous design plan. Um, understanding that the proposed traffic pattern, um, they'll, they'll still have two curb cuts, but we're narrowing up the southern curb cut uh, pretty substantially and making this an entrance only um, so that uh, large trucks, delivery trucks, tractor trailers, the traffic pattern is really going to be to come in on the southern uh, access, go to the back of the building, and then loop around the front, deliver the gas, and then exit. And all traffic from the site, regardless of where it comes in, will exit on the north curb cut. Um, to make this turning movement a little more functional, we just wanted to get as much room there as we could, so we shifted it five or ten feet. Um, we, uh, there was previously, as part of the proposed building here, uh, the previous owners were going to maybe do some second floor office space, I believe, um, as part of the building layout, and that use has been removed from the proposed design now. This will strictly just be a gas service station or the deli. Um, as such, we've just updated um, the parking and design flows associated with the water and sewer and things of that nature. And that's kind of reflected in, in the summary um, down in the bottom left corner. Um, so that was the next two uh, uh, revisions five and six. Um, revision seven, um, at the new owner's request, we've added a few more um, exterior light poles and light fixtures. Uh, we didn't have much uh, on the site plan previously beyond the building mounted lights and the canopy. Uh, we just thought given the space along the back and the perimeter and some of the parking areas, some additional uh, exterior lighting would be necessary. Um, still all LED downcast, uh, you know, shielded cut off fixtures. Um, and then the other couple are very minor, just utilities, uh, just where the underground electric and water come into the building based on the new current design building footprint light and mechanical location. We've just had to change the utility sizes and location to accommodate that. Um, I think in, in general, that's a quick rundown of, of the changes we're proposing. So I'll uh, either hand it over to the board of questions or we can go through some of the staff comments as well. Sure. Any initial questions off the top of the top of the lineup? All right. Um, so I think let's dig into the real, well, not the real, but the, um, the first issue, which is the canopy within the setback. Um, how far within the setback is the canopy still going to be? Can you scale? Uh, I've got one in my bag. Yeah. Yeah. Can you scale? So as proposed, it's probably about 15 to 18 feet into the front setback of our required 50. And at, at its furthest point. At its, its furthest like point. It. Yeah, it's kind of a, this triangle right here. So here's the setback mm -hmm. line. And, and so at its farthest point, um, currently, Currently, we're talking, you know, 35 feet or so of en encroachment. This again being the setback, and then this this dash line being the approximate existing canopy. And, so and that's about where the the permit approved before. Correct. So before, uh, we, they didn't want to lose this. You know, shifting the canopy all the way to the back was going to make a just given the way the right of way sits here with a 50 foot setback, it was going to make a big chunk of that that uh, parking area unusable. And so what we did is we had to maintain some component of this. So we actually held this corner and we just, instead of going three by two, we, were, we wanted, because the 
or it's layout of, of fuel pumps. You don't like having three in a row because then you're always got one in the middle you're trying to parallel park into or get to. Right. So we, all we were doing before on the originally approved plans where we, we were just lopping off the far south end of the canopy and maintaining the, the two by and then just extending it further. So now we've got, still have the two by configuration. We've just pushed the whole thing further to the uh, south or west rather. Yeah, so exactly. that means people are going to drive in here and then make their way across the front where people are parking and kind of in like this and then out like that? Correct. Or they'll be, they'll be able to enter on the, on the north as well. Okay. So the north curb cut will be a, a traditional kind of two-way curb I cut. Yeah. Um, we lobbied to have this maintained as a two-way, but in our, uh, essentially our discussions with public works as part of that first process, yeah. understanding we're very close to uh, an existing driveway here. Mm -hmm. um, Compromise, I guess I'll say, was made was to maintain you know, to narrow this down to a, a, an entrance only. Okay. So there'll be signage here, you know, you know, do not enter signs and, and whatnot. Right. Okay. I'm just trying to envision the internal circulation of the site if you come in here and then you need yeah. to exit out here. I would imagine, you know, most people are probably going to be coming in here, just getting gas and then moving back out, you know, or coming in if they don't need gas and just parking in. Uh, you know, we've got ten spaces here, five and three. And that actually reminds me of one other staff comment was the discrepancy in the parking spaces and uh, you're accurate in that the number here needs to be 32 and not three. So that's an update we need to make. So the circulation is gonna be really similar to the barn and Randolph. Yeah, uh, yes, yes. yes. Yep. I'm just trying to picture it in my head. Thanks, I had to figure out that noise. Thank you. So as far as looking at the, I mean, we've already approved the fuel canopy that was further into uh, the right of way, but that was really a, if I'm remembering correctly, that was just essentially allowing a grandfather. <coughs> we were proposing to keep the old canopy, whereas now that's going to be removed. This is a brand new canopy right. entirely. Yes. Um, What's the pleasure of the board on that canopy issue? That's the first question. Because it doesn't yes. quite work with the non conforming well, non conformity we issue we new, had before. We also don't have yeah, the, the, the new regs. The new, the new regs. Right. I mean, and this is this is it's a it's a bit of a conundrum because it ends up with a much better design. Well plus it's uh, I mean under the old regs it, it specifically said you could only reconstruct if it was damaged by fire, flood, explosion, or other casualty. I don't think there was any testimony that the old canopy was met any of those so it's not clear to me that the <laughs> how it was granted to reconstruct a larger existing canopy under the old regs in the first instance no I don't we weren't the, the old regs and I'm I don't know if anyone else was on this application before um, other than Kevin and I <laughs> um, but my recollection was it was just keeping the old canopy I, I believe the argument uh, previously was that yeah, as, as long as the, st the structural supports maintained, we were we were making an existing grandfathered nonconformity less nonconforming by removing a portion that was right. within the setback. Right. Um, that that was, I believe, how it was justified or mm -hmm. what, how, whatever language you want to use. Um, okay. A previous. I mean, this, this is the old. I mean, so keeping in mind that <clears throat> if they were to apply fresh today they would be allowed to do what they're doing without any limitations. So we're, when we talk about non-conforming, we're really only talking about sort of procedural hiccup where right. we have an existing permit, we shouldn't have to necessarily redo the entire permit, but the old bylaws don't, aren't as generous as the new bylaws. But to the extent that there's an issue created, it's one that dissipates, given that in the future, it's the new bylaws that would. Was, the, was reapplication under the 2018 regs contemplated? Uh, mm -hmm. I, it was contemplated. I guess it was at the in discussions with staff. This mm -hmm. appeared to be the path of least resistance, I'd say, or, or the, or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, given the minor scope of the changes that we're looking at. 
Sure. Yeah. Because uh, what we're reviewing is only the right. Delta, like yeah. o- only the things. And because of the flux with the new regulations and all the changes happening with them. Yeah. We, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't want to invest a lot in landscaping. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I think there were also some questions about then needing to apply, uh, apply for a new floodplain application for mm-hmm. potentially right. the whole right. site as well. Okay. It had already been approved previously. Yeah. So we have to pick one or the other. And no. Okay. Yeah. It, yeah. There's, there's no saying that they can't then reapply under the new regs if right. they have problems here. But sure. this seemed like, even though I know we have the canopy problem, it seemed like potentially the best way to go forward. This is still going to result in less canopy within the setback than was previously approved. Exactly. By, by a fair amount, yeah. 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 By quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <coughs> and... and uh, Again, I, I realize it's the current regulations don't mean anything, but mm-hmm. the current canopy wouldn't comply with the current regulations, whereas this proposed canopy would. Mm-hmm. The other conundrum we found ourselves in was when, so the company I work for bought this project as approved by the, you know, the Curly's got the project right. and Jeff got approved. So when we came on board, we started looking at it and we were like, they got approval for to keep a portion of a canopy, which you can't really do that because a canopy, each individual canopy is designed by a structural engineer as that structure. So when you try to keep this corner up here and these two Mm -hmm. columns and then try to tack on more, you're going to have a hard time finding a structural engineer that's going to want to do that. Mm -hmm. And they're all going to say, no, you can't do that. You can't. It's impossible. So what got approved was almost not workable. In that sense, so that's when we started digging deeper and went, "Uh oh, you know, we can't. Doesn't work very well." What's the pleasure of the board? It may be just simply the hour that we're at this evening. Um, My sense is this, is that um, the non-conforming structure reconstruction, we're not really talking about a reconstruction because it's, it's, that, that's really intended for damage by fire, flood, expo- explosion, or other casualty. Um, at the same time, it's not the same type of nonconformity that was envisioned by the old bylaws, which is to say um, something that the bylaws in, have moved forward. And I understand we can't sort of toggle back and forth between <laughs> new bylaws and old bylaws, at the same time, it seems ridiculous to, to ignore the reality on the ground as to what we have today uh, for our regulations governing this. So uh, I'm comfortable seeing this as a, not necessarily a reconstruction, but as a um, essentially a continuation of the nonconformity in a, in a manner that makes sense given the structural limitations of the existing what was approved originally back in 2016 and the structural uh, realities of this particular uh, canopy system which is you can't have um, a canopy that you cut um, or tack on to, it has to be to allow the canopy to survive as we've already permitted, we have to lo- look at the nonconformity in a larger sense. Um, and in this respect, given that these are the older bylaws, that if they were to come today, sort of at blank page, um, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. I, I think that the bylaws, the old bylaws, have that flexibility because they weren't as complex or as laid out as the current ones are. So the idea of creating, keeping a nonconformity or or having, this is really a technical problem 
less than you know uh, letting a reconstructing a nonconformity because nothing's happened to it. Um, but but it's the reality is that we've permitted and allowed this, and that means in some ways rebuilding it. We, we were obligated to act in a way that made sense, and I right. think you've just put that in the proper context. And as we're as we're transitioning from the old to the new <coughs> regulations, we're going to have to continue to be light on our feet for the time being, right. and uh, and be able to uh, uh, address it from these uh, uh, two perspectives. So I I, I, I agree with uh, with your reasoning. Any, I'm comfortable with that, Mr. Chair. Are you saying that yep. because we permitted it and allowed? A larger structure, assuming it was an existing structure, it would now be irrational to say that a smaller structure that is less non-conforming, even though it's built anew, should not be permitted. We've, 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 we're talking about this as though we have approved a footprint, and you're saying it's a technical a technicality as to whether that footprint is for something that is existing versus something that is being built anew. Yes. I think the footprint in this respect uh, is the apt um, concept. And we're trying to discuss or conclude perhaps that it would be irrational to not allow that footprint just because something is being built in it. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a exactly. proposed amendment to the footprint which will decrease the amount of non conformity. Yeah, we, we, we're already getting a benefit because the original permit talked about reducing the footprint. And now there's a, been an additional reduction. Um, but that comes with the idea that the materials to be used are not reducing the existing materials because to have any cut down in the footprint, there has to be an entirely new right. structure. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and what are, just another, another way to look at this that I'm not sure if it's necessarily <coughs> case law oriented, but that what we're looking to amend is the prior permit. So the right. starting point is the prior permit and what was previously approved. So in a sense, that previously approved footprint is a non-conforming structure, not what's actually there right this second, potentially, is one way to look at it. I, I mean, I remember <laughs> going around about this. Jeff, were you on the other, earlier one? I was, yeah. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I, I mean, I think we had a little bit, this is the same sort of pull and mm -hmm. push we had we did <laughs> <laughs> extensively. Yeah, um, uh, <coughs> these 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 old permits never fade away. Um, eventually, eventually, <laughs> please. But Mary's uh, looking, waiting for the day. That yeah. she doesn't have to but I, to. I mean, I, I. But I think that's what important. What's important to me is that yeah. the prior board did all that push and pull and said we're going to allow this canopy to exist in this footprint in the setback and now they're proposing to amend that approval for a decreased level of yep. nonconformity. So I don't it doesn't, I'm with you that it doesn't make any sense to deny that uh, under the regulations that previously allowed it. Right. The bigger one. Right. And, and and the fact of the matter is is that if they choose to get a new permit going forward, they already start out as a conforming right. structure. So I think I'm comfortable with where we have landed on this because it's fair. Um, and I look forward to not having more of these overlapping <laughs> ones. I'm sure staff does as well. Um, but I, I'd just like us to note for ourselves that this is something we're doing because of an exceptional situation and these types of rationale yeah. or contortions um, in the future, yeah. not for you, just in general. <laughs> yeah. um, are something we would want to be cautious of. Right. And and, and I think they're... I think that goes without saying, but yeah. agreed one yeah. thing. <coughs> no, but it's it's so the applicants who've gotten a permit under the old don't have to either go and redo completely new mm -hmm. or get stuck in some sort of limbo. Right. Um, I know why we're doing it now, but yeah. I'm just saying, it's, it's ter in terms of the type of logic that we're applying, I just want to make sure it is the being applied because of the... to avoid limbo. All right, uh, so let's talk about the garbage enclosure. Um, so, um, you're proposing the 
the same type of fenced-in enclosure to, for the dumpsters? Yeah, the, the fencing detail hasn't changed. Okay. We've just shifted it, like I said, uh, five to ten feet closer to the, to the south to provide more turning radius in the back. Right. <coughs> and and is this still within? Is this still outside the setback, or is this? It's in with. It's. I don't know if it constitutes a structure per se. Uh, fenced. Okay. A fenced in area. Um, you know, there's no. There's not going to be a shed or anything. It's mm -hmm. literally just a fenced in area for them to put the. You know, the trash recycling enclosures. Um, but it. It was previously within the setback, and it's still within the setback. Um, one thing I did bring along with me. Uh, it was pointed out in the staff notes that one of the conditions of approval uh, previously was that the applicant was to provide letters of support for the project and, sp and maybe specifically the enclosure um, to both the property owner to the west and south and I actually have copies of both of those letters um, that, I, that we were able to, to locate and I'll provide if you're willing to take them now but um, they're letters from uh, uh, Casella which is the property owner to the west as well as uh, Chuck and Paul Haynes Paul Haynes actually in the audience tonight um, just more or less th those both of those letters pretty much just say that they're in general support of the project as approved and presented right. previously. Um, unfortunately, they don't call out the enclosure specifically, but um, I thought those might be helpful in the board's assessment of us complying with that condition at least previously. Well, the, the Haynes do call out the trash enclosure. Oh, they do? There you yeah. go. Okay. Actually, both both the, both the of them do. Um, just so I'm, I'm, and I'm sorry, it's just the lateness of the hour. How, how far further back have we put trash from uh, the original permit so put it this way this uh, the shaded box here is the concrete pad the enclosure yep. and the fence was around it that box was always within the bubble <laughs> okay so you know where it, 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 over, it wasn't like way over here it was just from you know we just shifted it. it again I don't it's like a, it's a, just a couple of feet yeah, yeah five, just a couple five of feet, feet or not, something it's not that just a, the big issue I had with this I could never find I couldn't find the letters to okay that condition. And that's one of the yep. things that's required if that's within the setback area. So now I okay. have those. Okay, now you have the letters. Yep. Um, and Mr. Haynes, are you, have you been um, appraised of the change in the, the garbage location? Um, I wasn't aware of it. Okay. I, I don't see any issue with it. I mean, I feel that the letter from previously still maintains. Fine with it. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, and it would be a great irony if Casella had an issue. <laughs> well, <laughs> could just throw it over the fence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to throw over the fence, I don't know if we can require that. Okay. Uh, but you didn't move it. The Casella is the. Uh, they're, they're here. Yes, yeah, so it's not moving any closer to their property line. No, just slid. Oops. So the proposed dump, um, underground storage tanks, new tanks? are permitted to be within the 20 foot setback? Yeah. Yeah, the underground storage yeah. tanks. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, there's two in there. Um, and it's actually, I think they're in, a, they're in a better location there than they were up front. The reason we've moved them, just so you know, is they were located under the canopy. And if, mm -hmm. if you've been to, if everyone's been to gas stations, you don't want to drive over those things. We don't want you to drive over those things all the time. Right. And they're usually humped up pretty good to shed water, and they were all laid under the canopy, which is just not a good position for them. Plus, when the tanker comes to deliver fuel, he completely blocks everybody off from using them, so he can instead come in and go right over where they are and keep the fuel pumps open. Right. So when I was talking about front, I was thinking about the first proposed revision you wrote. Oh. Yeah. And just so. Um, I have a, a, a larger overall sense. The the building is just going to be a convenience store at this point. So it's going to look like the traditional gas station layout, canopy pumps, setback, um, convenience store. Yes. <coughs> no office buildings. No. Nope. It's just one story. One story. Yep. They are proposing a small deli inside with two yep. seats. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. You, yeah. But did you convenience store? Yeah. I right. mean, not yep. unlike any of the other. Convenience stores that shall not be named. <laughs> evening meeting. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so.
so one concern about the, so the red maples have shifted. Um, and how far off are they from sort of the, the sight line uh, from before, from Route 2? If you're coming, if you're heading east on Route 2. So, uh, again, I don't have, um, I don't have the previously approved. Here's the previously approved. Oh, you here's the second C2.0 yeah. in there. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There you so, go. Yeah. so here's, here's That's the, the original one. approval. Yeah. This is the originally approved one. So essentially, we've just taken these three trees. This one was very close to property line to begin with. And we've just brought them a little closer together and, and shifted them, you know, to this location. You know, right. So this one maybe moved down. I think the biggest impact is this one moving down maybe 15, 20 feet. You know? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to remember, <clears throat> but I part of the reason for those trees there were to create some visual breakup of that. Now I understand that if you're moving the underground storage tanks, then you don't want to put a tree where it's going to die. Um, but I'm wondering if there shouldn't be some other sort of landscaping there to visually break up, um, you know, just because that is closer to the road as people come see it. Um, yeah, I mean, I obviously can't speak for Matt or, or the owner. I mean, we could certainly investigate doing something here. I, I think the only reason we didn't want anything, we want, obviously it's a relatively built out site. And there's not a lot of room for snow storage uh, given the, the lack of room on the back property line. So mm -hmm. this kind of triangular piece of the area is probably constitute a significant amount of the snow storage. And understanding that any type of planting a small shrub probably won't survive there very well which was the intent to make this location of three of the larger deciduous trees and then get them as far back to provide them as much opportunity to you know survive long term um you know we there is uh, quite a bit of, of bushes and shrubs going along on the front of the area here as well as a couple more trees in the back and then there's kind of landscapes grasses and shrubs between the building and parking um if there's an interest in maybe supplementing with some bushes along the property line, I don't think it would be a problem necessarily. So the plan is to have the snow storage, but those, those are going to be, the snow storage is going to be behind the fuel tanks in that back yes. corner there. Yeah. 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 So I mean, I, I'm not really concerned, especially if you're putting those those trees there. You know, I'm, I'm not looking for any more planting there. I'm thinking just more where the, the old the tree would have been located. So if there's any type of like shrub and berm type, um, this, this starts to get a little outside my area of expertise here, but um, if, if the point is to lessen the visual impact for someone traveling like this, mm -hmm. could th there seems to be an existing tree maybe on the neighboring parcel, mm -hmm. would it make sense to put one is that way the immediate neighbor here. to the west? Uh, north? Yes, I believe it's that that way here. One thing to keep in mind with this, this whole thing, and it, I, oh, I'm just re re uh, recalling it now because it's been so long since I've looked at this, but if you see this dashed line here that kind of goes around this tree, it encroaches quite a ways mm -hmm. onto the adjacent property. Right now, that is all existing gravel parking lot that is kind of an encumbrance on this, this, there's actually a strip of property here that's the old railroad bed uh, right of way. And that's, and that's still a right of way. And that's still a right of way. And, but mm -hmm. as part of, and we actually located some train tracks as part of the survey you can see here. Mm -hmm. uh, but a part of that uh, um, original plan is, uh, is we're reclaiming all of this and turning it from gravel to grass landscaping essentially mm -hmm. as an additional benefit to just reducing the mm -hmm. footprint. Um, you know, I think the only uh, potential okay, issue yes. is we just between the property line and our pavement, we get very narrow there. Okay. So and I, yeah. I didn't realize how little space there was, so I think yeah. I planted yeah. a tree on your neighbor's property, which I'm not supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thanks for walking me through that. No, and that that, that actually, if, if we're talking about Agway, I mean they already have that fencing line too, so it's it's not the visual 
Yeah, it's another uh, commercial it. use, and yeah. I think that their, their parking lot, um, picked up some edge of pavement, kind of comes to, you know, right, right up into that area as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's satisfying my curiosity. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, any other landscaping questions or issues? Um, I think that the answer about the relocation of the fuel tanks and storage tanks, I'm, I'm satisfied with that, unless anybody wants to dig deeper than that. Um, Uh, and we've gotten confirmation on the parking spaces that it's 32. It is, yeah. Okay. And that's what's shown on the plan. It's just that uh, we need the somewhere in the transition, the, uh, the parking summary that did not get updated appropriately. So we'll make that correction. Somebody needs to get on the ball. Someone, someone <laughs> dropped it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so what's the pleasure of the board? Would you want to adjourn the deliberative session? I'm not convinced it's necessary, but I'm, <coughs> I'm not feeling it's necessary. I think it's a pretty straightforward amendment. Um, and I don't feel like we're putting on any particular conditions. I mean, it took a little while to, to, to walk through. Way, the, the and this may be something where the final written decision should be circulated yes. yeah. a that's little bit wider. That, that's really what I was thinking more yeah. than deliberative session for the okay. deliberative session. Well, I think that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I think it's probably the conditions one and three. Yep. So I'll go ahead and make a motion that we approve the amended site plan at 366 East Montpelier Road as presented in the application and supporting materials subject to the conditions that this approval does not result in the issuance of a new permit and so any expiration dates of the original permit are not affected by this approval. And additionally, that all prior conditions of previous DRV approvals uh, remain in full force and effect for the property. Motion by Ryan. Do I have a second? Second. Second, second by Rob. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion as stated, please raise your right hand. All right. So. There's approval, uh, and as I said before, we'll write up a decision. We have to do that within 45 days. Um, and no, actually, we don't because it's we've already voted to approve it. No, you still have to. No, no, it, it, there's actually oh. well, some case law on that. Anyway, we, we, we aim to please to get oh. that out. That then starts the clock ticking for the 30 day appeal period okay. um, on any amendment, but. Um, Nothing further at this point. Because we have to have our building in by September 15th. So, yeah. <laughs> building will be substantially complete. Substantially complete. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I think I better with your time. Thank you. Thank you. There's a case law that when you. Well, well let's. Uh, okay. Let's, 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 okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I will simply note that uh, our next regularly scheduled meeting is Monday, March 4th, 2019. Back to the Mondays. And we yeah. will be here because there is an application. Okay. Uh, we will start at 7 p.m. Mr. Chair, I would like to know I will be absent from that meeting. Duly noted. Uh, so we will, and uh, I'll be sending out an email to the board just to remind everyone that if you are not going to be here, uh, let us know as soon as possible. Um, I think we, we have five out of seven, um, and that's, I think we are a capable board, but obviously we do better when we have seven. Uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Kevin. Second. Second. Second by Kate. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much, and good night.